Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Salatu wassalam ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan ila yawmiddin. Amma ba'd. Dear respected brothers, sisters, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Uh, the theme of the conference is very interesting. It's uh, Muslims be Muslims, yeah? And it has a deep relevance with my topic. And it also conforms with the verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, aminu. O you who believe, believe. Now, how can a group of people who believe, believe. Ibn Kathir rahimullah says, تحصيل الحاصل محال To attain that which you already have is impossible. You're either a believer or you're a disbeliever. So how can you who you believe, believe? So what does it mean? See, there is my iman, your iman, when we're tried, a small trial and tribulation, our iman shakes. Our belief shakes. And then there is the iman of the heroes of Islam. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum. The Salaf al-Saliheen. Abu Dahdar radiallahu anhu was a Sahabi who was very close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was this Muslim who had a munafiq as a neighbor. And the munafiq, the hypocrite, the trees from his date branch, the branches from his tree, date tree, would come over into the garden of the Muslim. And when the dates would ripen, the dates would fall, and the Muslim's children would pick up the dates, and they would eat them. And what this manafiq would do, he would stick his finger into the mouth of the children, and take those dates out. So this Muslim went to the Prophet ﷺ, and he complained, and the Prophet ﷺ called the manafiq. And the munafiq came into the company of the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ said to him, if it was a munafiq, he said, sell me a date, and I will give you a date in Jannah. And the munafiq refused. And again the Prophet ﷺ said, sell me a date, and I will give you a date in Jannah. And he refused. And he went his way, and there was a sahabi sitting there called Abu Dahda radiallahu anhu. And Abu Dahda radiallahu anhu said, O Messenger of Allah, if I attain this date, will I also attain a place in Jannah? Will I also have a date in Jannah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Yes. If you bring me that date, you will have a date in Jannah. Because see, Abu Dahda knew that once you taste the dates of Jannah and you enter Jannah, you're not going out again. So Abu Dahda radiallahu anhu went to this munafiq and he said to this munafiq, he said, who pretended that he was a Muslim? He said, sell me a date. And the munafiq said, the Prophet asked me for a date, I didn't sell it to him, do you think I'm going to sell it to you? And Abu Dahda said, sell me a date. And the munafiq said, what are you ready to give me? And Abu Dahda radiallahu anhu had 60 gardens, 60 gardens in Medina. And he said, I will give you all my 60 gardens in Medina for one date. And he said, you're having a laugh, aren't you? You're going to give me 60 gardens of dates for one date? He said, yes. And he said, you want Rene on your bargain? He said, no. And he bought one date and Abu Darda radiallahu anhu gave him 60 gardens of dates for one date. And in some narrations it mentioned 600 gardens of dates. And he bought this date back to the Prophet wasallam, and he was elated. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what had happened. And when Abu Dahda radiallahu anhu came into the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Oh Abu Dahda, when you went, I promised you one date. Now by Allah, I see that your Jannah is filled with dates. Your Jannah is filled with dates. See, why? Because this was his iman. This was his iman. That the Prophet ﷺ promised him a date in Jannah. And he believed in it. And this is what when Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, aminu. Oh you who believe, believe. Believe. 
Let me give you an example, a tangible example. And because they're sisters there, let me give you an example which they can relate to, and you guys can relate to. See, you have a brother who's locked down by his wife. You know, everything, the 8 o'clock, he starts looking at his clock, watch. He's looking at his phone, he's looking at the time. He's in the company of certain brothers and he's got his phone on silent. Because he knows the missus is going to be ringing. <laughs> or you've got a guy who's a bit epicene. He's a bit feminine. You know, he's a... <laughs> <laughs> and you say to him, and you say to this brother, you say, Bro, be a man. What do you mean be a man? He's already a man. So what are you saying to him? You are saying, be a real man. And this is what Allah says in the Qur'an, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu aminu. Oh, you who believe, believe. Become true believers. Your iman becomes solid. Like Abu Dahda, like Abu Bakr, like Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu. Become like these people. This is what it means. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu aminu. Oh, you who believe, become true believers. Become true believers. And you know when many of us, we hear about these stories, about the Sahaba and the heroes of Islam, what do we think? We get a five minute buzz, and then it's all over. We are not motivated, we are not inspired. The reason that we have these stories, and that Allah recalled them in the Quran and the Hadith and the Athar, is that they are a source of inspiration. They motivate us. Because many of us live on the glory of our past. Somehow, you know, somebody else is going to come and rectify the situation. Somehow Umar ibn Khattab is going to come and rectify the situation. Somehow Khadija radiallahu anha is going to come and support the, 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 the ummah with her wealth. Somehow Abu Dhar is going to come and he's going to spend on the ummah. Somehow Khalid ibn Walid is going to come and he's going to assist the oppressed. And this is what many of us believe. But the reality is that when we listen about, listen about the heroes of Islam, they should be a source of inspiration for me and you. Me and you, they would motivate us. Because we are living in times of fitna. And in times of fitna, you need people of motivation. When Ali radiallahu anhu gave his first khutbah, what did he say? And this was an amazing time. Because this was a time of great fitna and difficulty. After the demise of the Prophet sallallahu no other difficulty was greater than the assassination of Uthman radiallahu anhu. And Ali radiallahu anhu was appointed as the Khalif. And what did he do? He, what did he say? This first khutbah, this is all he said. He ascended the pulpit. And he said, O oh believers, you are in need of a rajul fa'ala qawwal. You are in need of a man of actions and not of a person who just talks. Because if revolutions and change came through talking, me and you would have a revolution every hour. Because me and you are very good at talking. But the help of Allah does not come through talking. It comes through the actions of individuals. If you want the mercy of Allah to descend, if you want the help of Allah to descend, then you have to do actions. You have to perform actions. Because this is when the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends. And Ali radiallahu anhu said, O oh people, you are in need of a rajulun fa'al, an action man. Not of people who just talk. Not of people who just talk. If we want the mercy of Allah to descend, if we want the help of Allah to descend, we have to translate our talking into actions. You know, how often do you hear Muslims complaining, a wise in the help of Allah descending? How often do you have to hear them whinging? But how many actions do we do? Has this ummah paid its zakah and then Allah withheld its help? Has this ummah prayed salah like it should have prayed and then Allah withheld its help? Has this ummah made the Prophet ﷺ their role model then Allah withheld its help? Has this ummah made people like Abu Bakr and Umar and Khadija and Fatima their role models and then Allah withheld its help? Has this ummah had the concern of the Prophet Sallallahu Has it a concern for the rest of humanity and then Allah withheld this help? Or do we have this warped perception that somehow Allah is obliged to help us? Somehow, na'awdhu billah, as though we are Allah and Allah is our slave. 
Understand, you are the slaves. Allah is samad, Allah is dependent. You have to fulfill the conditions and then the help of Allah descends. That's when the help of Allah descends. Not that you do nothing and you go on lackadaisically in your lives. Dunya is your maqsid. You don't learn anything about your deen. And somehow Allah is obliged to help you. Allah is the Lord. Allah is Khalik. Allah is Malik. Allah does not require to help anybody. And your numbers don't make, make any difference. You can be 1.6 million, 1.2 billion. They don't make any difference. Your power, your wealth doesn't make any difference. What counts in the eyes of Allah is your quality, not your quantity. Your substance. And this is why Allah says, كَمْ مِنْ فِعْتٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَالَبَتْ فِعْتٍ كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ How often do you see that a small group of people, a small regiment defeats a large, a, a, a large regiment. Why? With the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the time of Khalid bin Walid, in the battle of Yarmouk, this was the ultimate battle. After this day, the Christians never came into the Arab Peninsula. The Muslims were 41,000. And the conservative estimate of the Romans were that they were 140,000. And Khalid bin Walid was checking his ranks. He was checking his men. And he walked past this young soldier who was looking at the Roman soldiers and their army. And he marveled at their numbers and how, how much weapons they had. And he said, how many are the Christians, and how few are the Muslims? And Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu said, don't, don't say that. For say, how many are the Muslims, and how few are the Romans and the Christians? Because weakness comes from being forsaken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Weakness comes from being forsaken by Allah. If you lose Allah, you lose everything. You lose everything. And if you attain the one Allah, you have everything. After the battle of the Murtaddeen, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu told Khalid bin Walid, now the superpower of the day, the superpower, the Persians are waiting. And he said, go and deal with them, and but allow your men, those who want to go home, because they fought many battles to go home. And Khalid bin Walid made the announcement, he has 13,000 men. Out of those 13,000 men, 11,000 decided to go. He only had 2,000 men and he was going to face the superpower, the Persians. And he wrote a letter to Umar ibn Khattab. And he said, Oh, Mir al-Mu'mineen, I've only got 2,000 men left. And Umar and, and, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu sent a reinforcement in the shape of how many men? He sent the, a reinforcement in the shape of one person, Qaqa ibn Amr, for 11,000 men. And the Sahaba said, Oh, Abu Bakr, what are you doing? What are you doing? 11,000 men, and you are replacing them with one man? And he said, yes, because those ranks which have the likes of Qaqa ibn Amr will never be forsaken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because these were men of substance. And by Allah, these people were never forsaken by Allah. You never had the concept of Guantanamo Bay, Belmarsh. You were never humiliated in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. One, one, Muslim prisoner was humiliated in the Byzantine lands. And the news reached Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz wrote a letter to the governor. And he said, before you place this letter down, free that Muslim prisoner. For by Allah, I will send an army which begins here and ends where you are. There was a never a time, really. There was a never a time like what happened in, the, in Israel and Palestine in the time of Muttasim. One Muslim lady was slapped in the Byzantine lands and she cried out, Wa Muttasima! And the, the Romans began to laugh and they said, Why are you calling Muttasim? He's thousands of miles away. You think he's going to jump on his black and white horse and come and save you? And the news reached Muttasim. The news reached Muttasim. And Muttasim sent an entire army for the izza of one Muslim lady. And he told every single one of them. He said, each one of you climb and when you go, go on a black and white horse. And you look, and you look, and you look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns the table. Wallahi, one Israeli soldier gets kidnapped. 
who by international law is upholding an illegal occupation. And the Israelis follow the sunnah of Mu'tasim and they send their entire army. They send their entire army. But the difference between their army and Mu'tasim's army is that Mu'tasim's army didn't terrorize women and children. They didn't knock out electricity plants. They didn't terrorize innocent women and children. And this is the reality. Because why? Because see, actions are which count by Allah. People of substance are which count by Allah. As long as you are heavy in the scales of Allah, you will be fruitful. You will be fruitful. And when you drop in the scales of Allah, then there will, you will have no weight by Allah. You can be 1.6 billion. But Allah, as the Prophet ﷺ defined, you will be ghufa ka ghufa sail. The Prophet ﷺ said, last night I saw a dream. And I saw a dream in Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was being weighed. And the rest of the ummah was being weighed. And Abu Bakr was heavier than the rest of the ummah. And then I saw Umar ibn Khattab being weighed. And then I saw the rest of the ummah being weighed. And Umar ibn Khattab was heavier than the entire ummah. And then in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, A time will come, you will be ghufa ka ghufa is sail. You will be like the froth, not even the froth, the froth is too good for you. You will be like the twigs and the rubbish in the froth. And the Sahaba said, will we be small in number? And the Prophet ﷺ said, you will be huge in number. Maybe he meant you will be over a billion in number. But you will be ghufa, you will be the scum of the earth. You will be a spent entity, the fifth columns of humanity. Why? Why is it that one man, Abu Bakr and Umar, are heavier than the entire ummah? And the entire ummah is light as the froth, over a billion in number. Why? Because see, their concern was the akhirah. Their concern was to attain the pleasure of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever has one concern, and that concern is the akhirah, Allah will suffice him in all his concerns. All his concerns. And whoever concern is the dunya, then the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah will give him unto his concerns. وَلَمْ يُبَالِ اللَّهِ فِي أَيِّ وَادٍ يَمُوتُ And Allah doesn't care where he drops dead. Allah doesn't care where he drops dead. Allah has no time for that person. And therefore, we are people, we are ummah. We aspire for jannah. We aspire for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore we have to be people of actions. We must always aspire for the highest. Always the highest. Second best is not good enough for this ummah. Really. Second best. When the Prophet sallallahu taught the sahaba, he said, ask for jannah. What did he say? He didn't say ask for jannah. He said, when you ask for jannah, ask for what jannah? Ask for jannah to firdaus, the highest. The highest. When you make a dua, the Quranic duas, when Allah says, رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَزُرِيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَائِيُنٍ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا You ask, oh Allah, make our partners and our children the coolness of our eyes and make us the imam of the muttaqeen. The imam. You ask him to become the imam of the muttaqeen because believers always aspire for the highest. You always aspire for the highest. And the problem is that, you know, any situation, we wait for somebody else to resolve the situation. Somebody else is going to help and assist. Most, the masjid are in a, in a state of total dysfunction. It's not our duty, it's somebody else's duty. People are dying to death in the Muslim world or in the non-Muslims. It's not our duty, it's somebody else's duty. How... Umar ibn Khattab is not going to come today. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is not going to come. Aisha and Khadija are not going to come today. If there are any heroes, you people have to become the heroes of Islam. You have to learn about your deen. And then you have to translate those, act- those knowledge into actions. The problem is that we don't translate, we talk. You know, How often do you see brothers, they're talking... For hours about the decadence of the Muslim Ummah. Come Fajr Salah, you can't wake up for the Fajr Salah. You can't wake up for the Fajr Salah. You can't change yourself. And you're talking about changing the world. You know there is something which is withholding. 
the help of Allah. And I'll tell you what it is. It is my and your actions. It is my and your actions. Because we have to be people of character. People should see our character. How often do you see people who have a good character? And they start practicing. And now they don't want to give anybody salam anymore. The Prophet wasallam said, None of you can enter into Jannah until he believes. And none of you can be a believer until he loves his Muslim brother. And shall I tell you a way of increasing that love? Give each other salam. Love your Muslim brother. But for us, everything divides us. The smallest thing divides us. We can always find something to divide us. You know, you come from, you come from Africa, you come from the Middle East, we come from the subcontinent, and if that's not good enough, you come from Bangladesh, I come from Pakistan, and if that's not good enough, then we go closer. You come from Sarhad, I come from Karachi, and if that's not good enough, then you belong to the Jat Bradri, you belong to this family, I belong to this family. You can always find things to divide us. You come from Somalia, I come from Pakistan, I come from Gujarat. You can always find things to divide you. But why don't we speak about those things which unite us? And what is that? It's La ilaha illallah. That's what unites us. And therefore, my dear respected brothers and sisters, and seriously speaking, we have to be people of actions. We have to contribute towards our society. We have to put positively back into our society. We were a nation whose first revelation was Iqra. Read. And you look at how illiterate our youngsters are. How illiterate our youngsters are. How do you expect the help of Allah to descend? You look at our areas. 50, some Muslim areas, 50-60% of women don't even know their father of ghusl. These are mothers, these are wives. They cook and clean for their children all their life. They cook. How are you going to have barakah in your house? When you have women who don't even know how to purify themselves. All their lives they go, go spend in a state of impurity. And when they die and they are given the bath, they are given the ghusl, this is the only time that they become pure. How do you expect the help of Allah to descend? And therefore I say one thing. You know, one thing, first step we need to take is that we need to make, create some muhabba and ulfa amongst us. You know, often you hear brothers speaking about, often you hear speakers speaking about unity. You know, they speak about, we need to unite. But you know, often the statements are very disingenuous. Because it means you have to unite on my world view. And that's what unity is. As long as you conform to what I believe in, that's what unity is. Now we know that people are always and always had different outlooks. Abu Bakr had a different outlook to Umar ibn Khattab. And if Abu Bakr and Umar argued on every issue, Islam wouldn't have gone past Medina. You know, they had different approaches, but the approach was within the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And the ulama have defined what the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is. Now as long as the difference are within the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we should carry on. Because there are other forces trying to divide us, and really we are falling into the trap. You know, before it was, oh division, you're a Wahhabi, I'm a Salafi, I'm a Sunni, I'm a Sufi. You know, all kind of divisions. But it's gone past that now, isn't it? Now other people are dividing you. They're giving you terminologies. So you're a moderate Muslim, you're a lefty Muslim, you're a conservative Muslim, you're a right wing Muslim. And people are giving you all these new labels. And you know, often we, we adopt these labels. We adopt them. Just to de- define and defend our irreligious disposition. So we see a brother who prays five times a day, who's got a beard, who wears a thobe. And you know, we can't do it. So what do we do? We want to feel good about ourselves. So he said, bro, he's a bit fanatic, isn't he? He's a bit hardcore, isn't he? You know why? Because we want to feel good about our own self. A sister wears a hijab or a niqab. And then you have other sisters who don't want to do it. But they want to feel good about their own Islam. She's really conservative, isn't she? She don't speak to men anymore. Because they want to justify the irreligious disposition. 
And let me give you an example, maybe a tangible example. Do you know, and maybe you Sufis don't know, but Sufi Sahib Junaid Baghdadi, you know, the, the current Miss England, uh, I'm not sure if she's current, but the one last year, she was a Muslim. She's known as to be a Muslim. She regards herself as a Muslim. Now, you never heard before that, oh, the Miss England is, is a Christian, is a Catholic, is a Protestant, is a Hindu, is a Jew. But as soon as she's a Muslim, and you know, you know, in the current climate, even if she looked like the back of a bus, they would have, you know, they would have chose her. Because they want to bring you out of your closet. Now, she was on a political show speaking about Islam and terrorism. And she, and before you guys start saying that Molana checks out Miss England, somebody told me this. <laughs> that is a disclaimer. Now, she was on this political show speaking about Islam, Islam and terrorism. And somebody, you know, she's relating the incident where she was at this contest and she met Miss Lebanon. And Miss Lebanon asked her, why aren't you wearing a swimsuit? Why are you wearing, so why aren't you wearing a bikini? Why are you wearing a swimsuit? And she said, the reason I'm wearing a swimsuit is because I'm a Muslim. <laughs> so, Miss Lebanon in her bikini said, I'm a Muslim as well. <laughs> so can you understand? The lesson from this story, not to speak about Miss England and Miss Lebanon, but can you understand where Miss Lebanon stands? Miss England for not wearing a bikini, wearing a swimsuit is a bit conservative. And where those sisters wear a hijab and a niqab to Miss England, our right-wingers are very, very conservative. Because it depends where you stand. And Allah defined this ummah as an ummatun wasata. A moderate ummah. This is what we are. We are a moderate ummah. And what defines our moderation? It is Allah and His Rasuls. And nothing else. So not what you feel like. It is what Allah and His Rasul define, and how Islam has been understood for the last 1400 years. Because the reality is, if the Sahaba didn't understand Islam, the Salaf didn't understand Islam, for 1400 years they didn't understand Islam. You guys in Whitechapel, London are not going to understand Islam. Simple as that. You're not going to understand Islam. And therefore, my dear respective brothers and sisters, you know, we need to be heavy in the scales of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to be people of actions. The Prophet sallallahu said in a narration related by Imam Muslim in his sahih, on the day of judgment, a man will come, he will be a rajulu saminul azim. He will be a huge fat man. Massive weight. He will be huge. A fat man. But in the scales of Allah, you know how much he will weigh? Have you ever thought what Abu Bakr looked like? Have you ever imagined how Abu Bakr was? A man who through thick and thin sided with the Prophet Sallallahu This man must have been massive. He must have been huge. The narration mentioned Umar and Khalid bin Walid were so huge that when they would sit on the horse, their feet would nearly touch the floor. Can you imagine? And they would say, and they would say that Abu Bakr was even braver than these two. So what did Abu Bakr look like? His daughter Aisha radiallahu anha mentions, my father Abu Bakr was so thin that his trousers wouldn't remain around his waist. He was so thin that his eyes had sunk out and his cheekbones were protruding. He was so thin that you could see the bones on his finger. He was, and when he would walk, he would walk with a stoop. He would walk with a stoop. This is how thin Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was. But they would say that Abu Bakr was the weakest in body. But when it came to the commands of Allah, he was the strongest. Upon occasion, Abdullah ibn Masood was climbing a tree. And he has very thin shins. And the Sahaba, they looked at his thin shins and they began to laugh. And the Prophet asked the Sahaba, he said, what's making you laugh? And they said, the thin shins of Abdullah ibn Masood. And the Prophet said, by Allah, if these thin shins were placed in one side of the scale, on the day of judgment. And the mountain of Uhud was placed on the other side of the scale. These thin shins would be heavier than the mountain of Uhud. 
Why? Because every pound, every muscle, every vein was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu said, on the day of judgment, a man will come. He will be a rajulul azim as sameen huge. But in the scales of Allah, he, in the scales of Allah, he will be lighter than a mosquito's wing. Why? Because there's no khair in him. There's no good on him. He had no concern for humanity. He had no concern for a responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the people who will be weighty. You may have no, really, you may have no status in the dunya. You may not have no big car. You may not have a car here, watch, live in a nice area. But your status is by Allah. As long as you are obedient to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is what his status. You know, amazing how Muslims suck up to people who have cars. Guy buys a new Q7 and he's got loads of new friends. I mean, what does it say about those friends? Wallahi, what does it say about those friends? That you are impressed because he's bought a piece of metal? You are sucking up to him because he's bought a new piece of metal? You respect people on the basis of where they live? On a few pieces, on a few bricks, on the basis of a few bricks. Is this the state that the Muslims have come down to? There was a time, what was the size of the house of the Prophet ﷺ? The house of the, the size of the house of the Prophet ﷺ was this. It was 4 meters by 4.5 meters. That was the entire size of the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Well, was there any house in the history of humanity which had more barakah than the house of the Prophet ﷺ? What was the size of the Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You compare it to this huge Masjid, East London Masjid. What was the size of Masjid Nabi? It was 30 meters by 35 meters. And after the Battle of Khaybar, it was extended slightly, just slightly. There was no fancy carpet on the floor. The ceiling barely exceeded the heads of those who prayed within it. And the walls were made out of unbaked clay. But the men and the women which emanated from this masjid were baked. Were baked. And until 8 Hijrah, there was not even a lantern in Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Tamim Dari radiallahu anhu bought a lantern in 8 Hijrah. From this small dark masjid emanated a light which extinguished the darkness of Kufr in half of the world. In half of the world. Because it was a place of substance. You respect people on the clothes that they wear? Really? I mean, amazing. It doesn't say, it says about, it says a lot about us. What state of decadence that we have reached. That we are going to respect a person on the clothes that he wore. When the Prophet ﷺ left this dunya, you know the clothes that the Prophet ﷺ left this dunya in had 11 patches. He was the greatest of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa when Abu Bakr left this dunya, the clothes that he had, had 14 patches. When Umar ibn Abdul Aziz left this dunya, who was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz? Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was that man, that when he was the Khalif, his Khilafah spanned from China to Spain, from the Caucasus to the depths of Africa. When he left, when he was dying, somebody came to his wife and they said, change his clothes, change his clothes. Look at it, can't you see he's got dirty clothes on? And she remained quiet. And again the person said, change his clothes, he's got dirty clothes on. And he remained quiet, she remained quiet. Upon the third time, the man said angrily, he's dying, why don't you change his clothes? And she said, by Allah, because these are the only clothes that he has. These are the only clothes that he has. So on the day, I'm going to finish here because the Lord is getting very... And I did promise him I'll finish early. So, no, no good to break a promise. On the day, the Prophet ﷺ said that, on the, that a man will come, he will be a huge mass, but in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will have no weight. And on the day of judgment, many people will come to, a, and they will be weighty in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will have no status in this dunya, but they will be weighty in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there was a Sahabi, and I'll finish on this story. There was a Sahabi. He came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and his name was Saad al Aswad al Sulmi radiyallahu anhu. And Saad al Aswad al Sulmi radiyallahu anhu was a Sahabi who had no status amongst the people. He had no money. He had no wealth. 
And he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, if I embrace, do I also go into Jannah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Yes. He said, What is my status in Jannah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, You will attain what is for Abu Bakr and Umar and the rest of the Sahaba. And then he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, why is it that nobody is ready to give me their daughter? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Is Amr ibn Wahhab here? And Amr ibn Wahhab was one of the leaders of Medina. And they said, Oh Messenger of Allah, no, he's not here. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Sa'ad, go to Amr's house. And tell him that I've sent you to request his daughter's hand in marriage. And Sa'ad went, he was elated because Amr was known for, he was one of the leaders of Medina, and his daughter was known for her beauty. And Sa'ad knocked on the door, and Amr opened the door. And Sa'ad radiallahu anhu said, he said, oh, Amr, the messenger of Allah sent me to ask your daughter's hand in marriage. And Amr looked at him, and he said, you, my daughter? He said, don't you know I'm Amr? One of the leaders of Medina, don't you know my daughter is known for her beauty? He said, on your bike. And his daughter was listening to this. And she said, oh my father, wait, wait. This is a request of the Messenger of Allah. Where will we be if we turn down the request of the Messenger of Allah? And she turned to Saad. And she said, oh Saad, go back and tell the Messenger of Allah, I am ready to marry you. And the nikah was performed on 400 dirhams. And Saad said, Messenger of Allah, 400 dirhams. I've never seen 400 dirhams. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Go to Ali Uthman and Abdurrahman ibn Auf and ask each one of them to give you 200 dirhams each. And he went to him and every single one of them gave him 200 plus dirhams. And he thought before he goes back to his wife, let him go to the marketplace and buy some presents for his new beautiful wife. And he went into the marketplace and he was buying his presents. And all of a sudden, there was a call. Ya khaylallahi irkabi, ya khaylallahi irkabi bil jannati abshiri. The call of jihad came. And the narration mentioned that Saad stood there and he looked to the heavens. And he said, Lord of the heavens and the earth, I will buy that which is pleasing unto thee. And he bought a sword and he bought a horse. And he went into the battlefield and he covered his face. Because he knew if the Prophet ﷺ saw him, he would send him back. He would say, Saad, you just got married, go back to your wife. And the Sahaba began to discuss amongst them, who is this man? Never seen him, covering his face. And Ali radiallahu anhu said, he's come to fight, leave him. And the narration mentioned, Saad went into the battlefield, and his horse was struck, and he fell off the horse. And when he fell off his horse, he stood up and he went like this. He pulled up his sleeves. And the Prophet ﷺ saw his dark skin, and he said, oh Saad, is that you? And Sa'ad radiallahu anhu said, May my mother and my father be sacrificed for your message of Allah. It is Sa'ad. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Sa'ad, there is no abode for you but Jannah. And Sa'ad became elated and he jumped back into the battlefield. And after a while there was a call, Usiba Sa'ad, Usiba Sa'ad. Sa'ad has been martyred, Sa'ad has been martyred. And the narration mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ ran into the battlefield. He ran into the battlefield and he took Sa'ad and he placed his head upon his thigh and tears were flowing from the cheeks to the face of Sa'ad radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet ﷺ, after a while, he began to smile and then he turned away. And the Sahaba who were standing there, they said, Messenger of Allah, we saw you do something today which we've never seen you do before. You cried, you smiled and then you turned away. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I cried upon the departure of my beloved companion. But when I saw his status by Allah, I began to smile because he had reached the hawd. And the Sahaba said, what is the hawd, the Messenger of Allah? He said, it is water, a fountain which is given to me, where the water is sweeter than honey, and whiter than milk, and whoever drinks from it will never be thirsty again. And then they said, what about this turning around, the Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet ﷺ said that I saw his wives in Jannah running towards him. And they were running with so much eagerness that their shins were becoming unveiled. And I looked the other way. And then the Prophet ﷺ turned to the Sahaba and they said, this is his horse and this is his sword. Take it to his wife and tell her that this is what he has left behind. And inform her that Allah has given him women and wives in Jannah, which are even more beautiful than she is. This was a man who a couple of hours ago didn't know because of his status in society that would he actually enter into Jannah. But this was his status by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who are heavy in his scales.
Come on, give it a bit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who are heavy in his scales. Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in this dunya. Ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us in Jannatul Firdaus. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika nashidu Allah.